Hi there, I'm Dr. Terry Shaneyfeld for UAB School of Medicine. Subgroup analyses are commonly undertaken during the analysis phase of a randomized control trial. Unfortunately, they're often problematic. In this series of videos, I'm going to describe some criteria that you need to think about when you consider the plausibility of a subgroup effect. In this first video, I'm going to give a very general overview of what subgroup analyses are and some of the common problems that they can have. So subgroup analysis is a reanalysis of study data to try to identify important differences in treatment effects among various subgroups. And these are undertaken in randomized controlled trials or meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials for an important reason. And that reason is that you have to understand that a study effect that we see is the average effect across all participants in a study. So some patients will have more benefit than others or harm and some will have no benefit or harm. So as a clinician what I'd like to know is is there somebody I should really offer this therapy to and are there other groups that I should avoid giving this therapy to and a subgroup analysis tries to help answer that question. Now subgroups can be constructed on a variety of factors. The most common thing are various patient characteristics. So you may want to compare effects in the old versus young, one ethnic group versus another, patients with diabetes versus those without diabetes, etc. You can also divide, de, uh, develop your subgroups across treatments. So I may want to compare a high dose versus a low dose or something, a look at IV versus oral or different drugs in the same class. So these are different ways that subgroups can be um, developed and analyzed. Now one of the problems unfortunately is that many subgroup effects that are seen in one study are late, later proven to be spurious when a more definitive study is done. So you need to be wary about subgroup analyses and evaluate them very carefully. And one of the problems is that subgroup analyses are often done after the primary analysis of a study shows no effect and the authors are trying to undergo a fishing expedition to hope that they catch a positive finding that they can report and this hopefully you can understand is a problematic pro uh, thing. And as this cartoon shows, if you torture data long enough, it will confess something. What that means is if you keep cutting up your data and relooking at it and relooking at it, you ultimately will find something. And I talk more about this in a later video uh, in this series. So here's an interesting analysis that was published in The Lancet. And what these authors looked at was the use of carotid and darterectomy in symptomatic patients with significant carotid stenosis. And these patients were randomized to carotid and darterectomy. And down here at the bottom, this is the absolute risk reduction. So you want to be on this side, meaning you gained benefit from carotid and darterectomy. If anything's over here, that means you actually had harm from carotid and darterectomy. And this diamond is the overall effect of the study, about a 12% reduction uh, in stroke rates in patients undergoing carotid and darterectomy. And each of these boxes, the treatment effect in each of these subgroups, and the authors broke down the subgroup uh, into groups based on their month of birth. And so the question comes up is, should I not be offering carotid and darterectomy to my patients born between January and April who have a symptomatic carotid artery stenosis? Because in fact, if you see here, they had no benefit or maybe even a suggestion of harm if they underwent carotid and darterectomy. So you need to be wary of subgroup analysis. Clearly that previous subgroup analysis I showed in the last slide is a spurious association. It doesn't make any sense that the month of your birth should impact the effect you have from carotid and darterectomy. And one of the things you have to realize is that when we break up a study into different subgroups, all of a sudden we probably have an imbalance in prognostic factors among those groups. One of the reasons we randomize people is to equalize confounding and prognostic factors. Well, if you start pulling out, let's say, diabetics versus non-diabetics, the diabetics are going to be very different prognostically from the non-diabetics. So you've totally negated the benefit of randomization in subgroup analyses. Often a fairly, lar fairly large number of subgroup analyses are undertaken, making false positive findings much more common. And because you break up your population into smaller and smaller subgroups, subgroup analyses are often underpowered. So false negatives are also common. And then finally, unfortunately, the statistical analyses are often done incorrectly in a subgroup analysis. And we'll talk about how to do this properly in a later video. So if you're going to read and try to decide if you want to use a subgroup analysis, you should think about these criteria. And we'll go through these in later videos. Um, 
the more of these that a subgroup analysis meets, the more sure you can feel that the subgroup effect is real. Now I developed an app called EBM Raider that contains all these criteria and also criteria of how to read a variety of other study designs. So I don't expect anybody to remember these criteria, but now you have a tool in the palm of your hand uh, that you can use to critically appraise all study types, but especially as we refer to here, a subgroup uh, analysis. And finally, if you want to read a little bit more, these are the uh, studies and papers that I looked at to develop this series of videos. I hope this video gave you a very general understanding of what subgroup analyses are and some of the common problems they can encounter. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the Contact Me section of my blog. Have a great day.